All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am Lee Stone. So you have received many documents from me lately, I'm sure. Can everyone hear me? Is everyone able to participate? It's looking good. I'll assume that's a yes. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Now, you are writing exam on Monday. You all know that better than anyone. And I can understand that you are afraid and anxious about this constitutional law exam. I guarantee you that it is not as difficult as you think it is. So, the approach for today's lecture, which is the same approach you should use throughout the weekend when revising constitutional law, is to simply think logically and clearly about what you, as a person, expects of our state. And when I say our state, I mean the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary functioning as they are supposed to do in terms of the Constitution, and how all of the other constitutionally established bodies all work to ensure that the state works properly, and what the expectation is that you have about how they should work in terms of the rule of law, in terms of democracy, in terms of ensuring that I'm not quite sure what to do there, but I think it's okay now. Uh, all right, so you need to think in those terms. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hope it stays that way. All right, so let us start then with the document I uploaded on my UNISA the 14th of October. The document had as its title, The Personal is Political, and then the subtitle was Constitutional Law Transforming Society Through the Dynamic Power of Identity and Culture. So that title has a meaning. It means that because constitutional law is a political branch of the law broadly, you can't deny that politics and constitutional law are very closely related. And your role as a person, an individual in society, is to make sure that constitutional law works. It's personal. You will be a direct beneficiary if the Constitution is enforced and implemented as it was intended to be. All right, so that, you, know, you will have, if you've read the document, and I, if you don't have it yet, please email me after the class and I will email it to you. It's a short document, only seven pages. But I started by setting the contextual scene within which you as constitutional law students find yourself at the moment, which is that the judges and the lawyers who are already in practice, who are looking to appoint new candidate attorneys, all say that the students who are coming out of law degree, out of law school in South Africa, across the country, it doesn't matter which university you've come from, that these students are out of their depth, and are unable to communicate effectively, and they have difficulty comprehending important legal texts, like our Constitution. So my intention today is to show you how you can personalize constitutional law so that you understand it better, so that you can explain it better, and actually make it work. All right, so now let's tell you how we do this, or how I envisage that we do this. The very first way in which a pedagogically sound teaching approach is supposed to be uh, constituted 
is that there must be a good framework which is also accurate and which enables the students to see how everything works together. That's why on page 7 of your study guide, I have a diagram. That simple one-page diagram is the framework for constitutional law. Every single thing you need to know is actually in that single diagram. And how is the diagram composed? I have drawn it in a way to show you that at the top of the page are the words rule of law, democracy, constitutionalism, separation of powers. This document, this picture, this picture <laughs> on, in your study guide, the diagram, diagrammatic representation of constitutional law. So if you look at the top of the page and you see those words, constitutionalism, rule of law, democracy, separation of powers, what is the message that I'm trying to convey there? Hopefully it will be evident to you that those concepts permeate every single thing about constitutional law. In other words, every single act of any person in government any act by any one of us, any act even by the president, must be in terms of the rule of law. Any act by the legislature, and when I say the legislature, I'm meaning all 400 members of parliament, including, very importantly, the Speaker of Parliament, they all have to do everything strictly in line with what the Constitution says. Nothing more and nothing less. Democracy too. We have a democratic system because we know that every five years elections are held and we are able to go to the polls and vote for representatives who we then place in Parliament to pass the laws for us. And because we voted for those representatives, we empower them to vote on our behalf, to vote for the president. They choose the president for us. They choose the deputy president by virtue of the fact that they choose who the president is. And because we have now bestowed on the president this enormous power to be the head of state and head of executive, we then give to the president the equal right to decide for himself who he wants to appoint as his cabinet, the ministers and deputy ministers. So we know that section 91, subsection 2, tells us that the president can do that. And we've seen that he does that. We've seen he's been quite active at that. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to that. But I'm just trying to show you how to understand the diagram, because if you understand the diagram, everything should become clear to you about how all of the aspects of constitutional law work together and are interrelated. So democracy, we've already covered. Rule of law, it's apparent. Constitutionalism. If you understand that constitutionalism means that we have an entrenched constitution, meaning you can't easily change it. And we know that because section 74 of the constitution provides the explicit threshold of votes that has to be met or the procedures that have to be followed in order to change the constitution. It's not easy to change the constitution. We also have a supreme constitution. So that is really the key. If the Constitution is supreme, it means all law, all conduct, always must comply with the Constitution. And if it doesn't, it must be declared invalid. Another feature of constitutionalism is that you have an independent judiciary. We have an independent judiciary, which has the power to interrogate issues by asking the legal counsel for the evidence to support the arguments they're making and then reach 
a compelling conclusion about whether or not the conduct complained of or the law is invalid. They must declare it invalid if there's in consonance between the, what the Constitution says and what the conduct of the law is. Another feature of a constitutional state is that there is democracy. So I've already discussed that. We know we have a mostly democratic state. And I have a reservation, but I'll come to why I say that our democracy is a little bit problematic. We also know that in a constitutional state, protection of human rights is foremost, and we know that our constitution has a Bill of Rights. So we have a constitutional state. To return to the meeting, Frank Hound, to become the moderator, press one. To use the kills me. Press two. Okay. Um, line, then, two. very importantly, and that's why it's really in bold at the top there, is the t concept separation of powers. Now, this <laughs> concept is possibly the most important for your understanding of how constitutional law is actually supposed to work. So separation of powers literally means that the three principal organs of state, being the legislature, executive, judiciary, each have distinct separate functions, and one organ is not supposed to assert the functions or the powers of another. But I will come to it soon enough that in South Africa, we don't have a strict separation of powers. We actually have a decolonized form of separation of powers. So I'll come to that too. Very important. Remember that. All right, so that's the top of the page. Then the block there under is where I describe how the state functions in the national sphere. So that's where I explain in the national sphere, we have a national assembly. How's the national assembly composed? I've just described it. We vote for those people. What does the national assembly do? It amends, it repeals, it enacts new law. The national assembly also has the very important function of maintaining accountability of the executive. And that's why we have the State of the Nation Address, where the President, once a year, has to actually give a proper, concrete account of what has happened in the preceding year and how the State intends to achieve the policy objectives in the following year, because he's got to account to the National Assembly. So the executive then, for its part, and with the President being head of the executive, the executive must ensure that the laws that have already been passed by the legislature are actually implemented. So that's the principal task, is making sure that on a daily basis, if we have the right to health, right to education, that it's being given effect to by the ministers responsible, and that minister then delegates tasks to everyone underneath them and says, you need to make sure that the law is effective comes alive, works for the benefit of the people. And then the third organ is the judiciary. The judiciary does not intervene unnecessarily into the workings of the, of the executive or the legislature unless it is absolutely essential. Uh, I'm not going to say too much more about the ju judiciary's role now because it is coming to us later in the counter-majoritarian dilemma discussion. But I want you to also realize in that picture that right in the top right-hand corner, I have the words Chapter 9 Institutions. And it's separate from everything else, but it's also at the top of the page because if it's at the top of the page and it's separate, that should indicate to you, A, it is independent, because it's not closely aligned with anything else, but it's also got an overarching function of making sure that the executive and the legislature actually works properly. And what is the best example we have of that? The public protector. We know that the public protector has extensive powers to investigate, 
any allegations of impropriety, maladministration, corruption, prejudice that is caused to society or to an individual by anyone in any position of power, even the president, even the National Assembly that's not doing what it should be doing in terms of the Constitution. Okay, and the Independent Electoral Commission is another important Chapter 9 institution. We don't even need to discuss that very much because we know their role is to ensure that every five years, the elections that are held are free, fair, transparent, credible, and that everyone makes an, or is given an opportunity to register, to vote, and then to vote. That's their task. Easy as that. So then moving down the page, you will see that I have dotted lines linking the word judiciary with the concept of the Judicial Service Commission and the National Prosecuting Authority. The reason why it's a dotted line and not a, a distinct or clear line is because those two institutions are not part of the judiciary at all. They are independent of the judiciary. But both of them serve to ensure that the judiciary works as it should. Now, the National Prosecuting Authority is, as we've know, known from our material, it is described as being sui generis of its own unique kind because there is the constitutional requirement that it is definitely not part of the judiciary but also definitely not part of the executive. The reason for that is because there cannot at any time be any interference in the proper functioning of the National Prosecuting Authority. So that's why you have, in Section 179 of the Constitution, a specially appointed through a rigorous process, a person who is fit and proper, who has the relevant educational qualifications, the relevant experience, he or she is the national director of public prosecutions. And he or she must take final responsibility for deciding who will be investigated and who will not. Why that is so important, and it is discussed in your study guide, is the fact that there have been incidents in the past where Jackie Salebi was about to be arrested, you might recall this, for alleged corruption. But because he was head of the police, he was our police commissioner, and he was also the head of Interpol, which is the international police body, it didn't look very good for him to be arrested. So then the president at the time, President Mbeki, said to the National Director of Public Prosecutions at the time, do not investigate or arrest Jackie Salebi before I tell you to do it. Do you agree with me? That is an intrusion of the independence of the National Prosecuting Authority. They're not supposed to be told what to do by anyone. All right. Likewise, Judicial Service Commission. It's not part of the judiciary, but it is established to make sure that the members of the judiciary, so all the judges in all the high courts, meaning high court, Supreme Court of Appeal, and Constitutional Court, are equally fit and proper, appropriately qualified, have the experience, and that they represent society in terms of gender, race, and their transformative ideals or philosophy. Because we know that the judiciary needs to move South Africa forward in its decision making, and therefore we cannot continue to have all white male judges continuing to make the decisions because that doesn't represent or mirror society. Um, and then underneath that, I, of course, then describe the provincial sphere. Provincial sphere is just like the national sphere, but it is localized to each of the nine provinces. 
Equally, it has its own legislature and it has its own executive branch. And then the judiciary at the provincial sphere. I only have it in that diagram, even though we know that the judiciary doesn't actually form, form part of cooperative government. But I have it there just to highlight to you that section 173 of the Constitution tells us that if you are ever going to court on a constitutional matter, you can only go to a court that has jurisdiction. In other words, it has the power to deal with constitutional issues. And it's only the sort of provincial sphere courts that have that power, meaning the high court. So that's why we have a high court in Pretoria, high court in Johannesburg, high court in Bishu, high court in Durban. These are the courts that are able to deal with constitutional issues. So that's why at the bottom sphere, I have the local sphere, and I've got magistrates' courts written there. But I specifically state these courts have no constitutional jurisdiction. So in an exam, if there's ever a question of which court do you go to in this constitutional issue, don't say magistrates' court. I probably should have put it the other way. Say high court. <laughs> Forget about the magistrates' court. And then on the right-hand side, I have a bracket that refers you to cooperative or multi-level government. And simply, I have the, what are the rules for resolving the conflicts that may arise between the national, the provincial, and the local sphere in the execution of their legitimate constitutional tasks, meaning if they're passing laws and there's a clash between the law, the bylaw passed by the municipality and a clash with the national le level law. There are rules in place and they're actually not that difficult. We will come to it. But you then use those rules to decide or be able to convincingly argue which law will prevail, will override another in that circumstance. So that's the diagram. But let us come back to the document called The Personal is Political. If we understand that the entire policy of the Department of Education in South Africa is to create a higher education system of which you are all part, which system um, is intended to transform society, then we need to make sure that the kind of education you are being given achieves certain objectives. What are those objectives? We need to make sure that the way you are taught constitutional law, but all the other courses as well, must instill in you an understanding that it is equally your task to create a fair, equitable, non-racial, non-sexist society. It's your task to make sure that the society we live in is democratic, that it is a system where the education that we deliver to you is fit for purpose, that it empowers you to be able to perform the tasks that will be required of you either in government, if you want to work for government, or in the, pri the private sector. So that's why you need to take ownership of the law. And why I'm saying this is because many students, and I don't understand, well, I do understand why, but I, I think you need to overcome this. You look at this textbook and you think to yourself, I just can't handle it. It's too long, too complex, too disturbing, technical. If you make an emotional connection with the content, you'll understand it better. That's why I call it the personal is political. And I'm going on and on about this only because I need you to realize that it's a personal task of yours. And if you think about it personally, when you see the exam questions, you'll be able to instinctively understand this is the best approach to answer these questions. All right. Um, I, uh, to bring us back to another 
point is the document that I submit, uh, put on my UNISA being the personal is political. At the same time, I put a document called Tutorial Letter 103. All it contains in it is three cases. Only three, and it looks like a long document because I've given you ver verbatim the whole of the EFF case. I did try and take out the parts that were really not necessary to make it a bit shorter. So it's the EFF case decided in February 2016. It came out after the study guide was prepared, but it is a fundamental case. We'll discuss it now. It then has the case of DA versus the President of the Republic of South Africa, decided on the 4th of May this year. Brand new case, short judgment, but it is of such fundamental importance to your understanding of constitutional law. And then the third case is the UDM versus the Speaker of the National Assembly. And we should all know what it's about from August this year. It's about whether or not the Speaker of the National Assembly has the right to decide whether the vote of no confidence against the President should be secret or not. So they're not difficult cases at all. So you'll see then that I've integrated into the personal as political document the commentaries that I've provided to each of those cases. So after the actual case is provided, I then give a short commentary where I discuss it and I tell you what is important about it. And I've highlighted, for example, the most essential parts. So paragraph 7 of the UDM case, you will see it's where the constitution, you don't even have to look at it now, but it says, Amantla Awetu, Mai Buye i Africa. Now surely that should resonate with you. That's why the Constitutional Court used that language. They want you to realize you have the power. It's you who can restore South Africa's wealth if we all play a role in holding our public representatives accountable. All right, so as I then say, if, I, if, if I change the way you think and the way you behave, hopefully it will have a positive impact on society. Um, so I'm going to move then to how I intend to execute this task of transforming society through constitutional law. And the starting point there is that I want to create thinking citizens Citizens who question what they see, debate what they see, make logical deductions based on the law they know, the facts they're seeing, and be able to explain to other people who might not have any idea about constitutional law about what is wrong with the president acting in a certain way or with parliament passing a law and not caring about our input. And therefore, I emphasize that if we give this African and personal interpretation to constitutional law, we are effectively decolonizing our law. So, how do we decolonize the law? The very first thing we need to do is think about constitutional law in terms of a notion that you're all abundantly aware of and which should have resonance with your identity and your culture, that is Ubuntu. Would you be able, convincingly, to explain the similarities between Ubuntu and constitutional law? I provided in that document a discussion, it's my own discussion, but please feel free to think about that. So let us do that. How do you see a relationship between constitutional law and Ubuntu? Or do you not? Some students say, I don't see anything. I hope you do. <laughs> so how do you see this link? Well, using 
the definition of Ubuntu that's in your study guide, it's comprehensive definition in the study guide, if you can identify from that definition that Ubuntu signifies such things as communalism, in other words, we all have to work together for a common objective. That's why Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Gabantu. We all are people because of other people. So it's not just a saying. It's actually supposed to mean we all have to work together, particularly in the context of scarce resources. What are the scarce resources that we're referring to? Money. Yes, money. For housing, for higher education, that's probably one of the most pressing issues of the day. Money for proper health care, so that 144 people don't die unnecessarily when the Department of Health decides to move them from life acidemeni because it costs too much. That everyone has a dignified life, that they have a home, that they actually are protected from the elements, that they live a meaningful existence. I also would like you to think about the concept of scarce resources in terms of a scarcity of our leaders to actually comply with the law. A resource, in my mind, is the Constitution. And we know that the Constitution, that's the whole objective of constitutional law, is to indicate to us exactly what everyone in power can do, can't do, must do, and the limits of their powers so that they don't overstep the mark. But un unfortunately, what we're seeing too often is that our leaders seem to just disregard the law. And that's because... There's a scarcity of the consciousness to abide by their constitutional commitments. Um, I, I want to bring in colonization here, but let me wait a little bit with colonization. Um, okay, so that's one, one argument that you can make about the relationship between Ubuntu and constitutional law. That, and I suppose we can take that further, that if we all are in this together for the common good, not just of ourselves now, but intergenerationally, our children and children's children. We also need to build a culture where we all comply with the rule of law, because if one doesn't, all the rest of us are going to suffer. And when I say the rule of law, I'm meaning criminal activity, all just not following the constitution as you should. And here I'm really speaking to the people who are working in the executive branch of the state. So everyone in the Department of Home Affairs, Department of Social Welfare, Social Welfare particularly, Batabile Tlamini seems to be sitting back saying, oh, you know, we're trying to negotiate with the post office. She's not serious about the fact that if there's not an agreement in place, Millions of people are not going to get the social welfare grant that they rely on to survive. So you see this link? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, and so the rule of law. We all have to comply so that we all are happy. If some don't, there's resentment. There are other consequences of non-compliance. How else can we see the similarity between constitutional law and Ubuntu? Democracy. If Ubuntu means we all are equal in worth and dignity, then if you are an adult person of sound mind, you should be afforded an opportunity to vote just like everyone else. Your vote counts. You mustn't be arbitrarily denied the right to vote because the IEC says, oh, we, must, you know, we don't really want to go to the prisons and allow the prisoners to register to vote because it's just too much effort. We've seen in the August case and the Necro case that that's not acceptable. We all have a right to vote. Um, equally, 
if we vote and we elect those representatives, they have to be accountable to us. We put them there. They have to be accountable to us. They have to comply with the law. And they must be able to be accountable, responsive, open about every decision they're making. And that leads us to the point, because invariably, you can't just discuss these kinds of things in isolation. I need to see actual support for your argument, and the support would come from case law very often. So think then about the context of the Merafong case. If the rationale is that we're all equal, and we're all of equal worth, and therefore that we all have an equal right to participate in our democratic processes, including the process of drafting the laws, and we know from the Doctors for Life case that when the, when the parliament is drafting laws, they have to give the public an opportunity to participate. So think about the Merafong case, where parliament said, well, we're going to draft a new law where we move Kutsong in the greater Merafong area out of Gauteng and into the northwest province. And the people said, we don't want this. And the people started protesting, and the legislature was continuing to draft the law. Eventually, the law was passed without any regard for the interests of the people living there. So what was the consequence? In your study guide, that Kutsong became like a war zone and became completely ungovernable because they rejected the fact that they had been sidelined from participating in an important process, being lawmaking, because the Constitution says they have the right, and yet the lawmakers said, we're too important, we don't need to listen to the people on the ground. Do you see that, uh, hopefully, comparison with Ubuntu? Um, let us find more. I uh, did go on in your notes, so feel free to <laughs> engage. Um, I'm just trying to see what else I could say about the link between Ubuntu and constitutional law. Well, Bartol Pele principles, the people first. When you walk into a government department to get your ID document or your social welfare grant, you're supposed to be treated with respect and dignity. What about social justice? Social justice means that there should be measures in place to ensure equality, particularly for those who've been deprived because of apartheid. And therefore, that the, the state must make sure that there is money available to build adequate houses, adequate schools, adequate clinics. That's social justice. Can't it continue with certain people living in deplorable conditions while money is being siphoned off by those in power. So equally, in a society governed by Ubuntu, because we're all in this together, things like corruption should not be tolerated. I don't know what's happening here. It's really irritating. <laughs> Very. OK. Um, Yes, accountability. I've mentioned accountability. Everyone has to account to each other. We're coming there. We're coming there. I like that one. Okay. Um, so the Marathon case is very important. In fact, there are numerous cases on Ubuntu that I would like to see you discuss. Whether or not you've studied them in constitutional law. So, you might, well, everyone knows Makwanyane. But the Makwanyane case is a great example about Ubuntu. That the court said, our constitutional project is such that we specifically, well, the drafters of the constitution, our representatives, specifically included a provision on the right to life. Because during apartheid, we know how many people were tortured and killed arbitrarily at the hands of the state. And that's why when they interpreted the Makwanyane case, they said, we need a state that's governed by Ubuntu, so we must respect the integrity of the life of a human being. 
They can be imprisoned for life, but we will not kill them or deprive them of their life. Are you aware of the Azarpo case? Yes, Azarpo is an excellent example to describe how Ubuntu resonates with constitutional law. Because the Azarpo case fundamentally dealt with the fact that at the end of apartheid, in order to try to make the transition as smooth and seamless as possible, the specific decision was taken to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we know that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has as one of its core factor, criteria is that if a person who has perpetrated gross violations of rights during the apartheid era comes before the commission, gives a full and frank account of exactly what they did, how they did it, why they did it, they can be given amnesty. Consequence of amnesty is no civil or criminal sanction or punishment. So Azarpo, the political party, went to court and they said, this amnesty is an affront to the dignity of everyone who lost relatives, sons, daughters, brothers during apartheid. We need justice. And the Constitutional Court said, we're aware that justice needs to be served, but in South Africa, we need to move away from vengeance and move towards reconciliation. So amnesty was decided as the compromise. So Ubuntu is there, that we are striving, after, and I, my colleague Lesejo is actually writing a master's dissertation on this exact issue about race dynamics in South Africa. The idea was to bring South Africa together. It hasn't worked yet but hopefully it will start to work. Um, the Bay case, Bay versus Magistrate Kyalicha, where the magistrate said, the customary law is that only the male child shall inherit. The primogenitor rule, which you've probably learned in family law or succession. That's not Ubuntu if the girl child is being arbitrarily discriminated against. So you know these cases from other modules. Feel free to discuss them because I need to see that you understand that Ubuntu is constitutional law and vice versa. That's the only way we're going to make the state work better is if we all care enough and we understand that the, we need, and now I'm talking about inter interpretation of statutes, but a purposive interpretation of the law. What is the intention of the Constitution? It's for us all to be happy and prosperous. Um, so, of course, you can also use current examples, like the Sasa situation. It's not Ubuntu for Minister Dlamini to sit back and delay in deciding on who's going to provide social welfare grants. It's certainly not tolerable for President Zuma to have received the HEA report in August on higher education and whether it should be fee-free, and sitting on it, not, not being accountable to us, open, transparent, not giving us an opportunity to see what it says and be able to participate in this decision-making going forward. But then, what we have seen is he, instead he does release it, only because he was threatened with legal action if he didn't, and then he still has the audacity to try and say that he's going to disregard everything in the report anyway because his possible son-in-law has got a better plan. That's not Ubuntu. Are you, <laughs> are you agreeing with me? Um, all right, so now let's move on to colonization. And I think this is an important discussion. We have a dem democratic system in South Africa, and it is, for all intents and purposes, a multi-party democracy. We know that. All political parties who pay a registration fee can participate, but what we actually have in practice in South Africa 
is what Sujit Chowdhury refers to in your textbook and at the back of your study guide as a dominant party democracy. What is the consequence of a dominant party democracy? Sujit Chowdhury says, now he's an Indian, but he's written a lot on the South African constitutional system, drawing a lot on the Indian experience. He says the following. The pathology, so the cancer of a dominant party democracy can you hear now can we all hear now okay good Sorry, I think when everyone presses on the mic, it switches off everywhere else, and that's why we can't hear. Yeah. I think there's a problem with the system that it keeps switching itself off. Um, okay, can we all hear now, though? Okay, so Sujit so Chowdhury says the pathology of a dominant party democracy is the colonization of independent institutions that are meant to check the exercise of political power. Sorry, we couldn't hear you from colonization. We lost you. It's, so are you able to repeat? I will repeat, but I'll also tell you it's in at the back of your study guide. So it, dominant party democracy is the colonization of independent institutions which are meant to check the exercise of political power and it enmeshes those independent institutions into webs of patronage. Let us be serious when we think about this concept. Can you think of any independent institutions in South Africa which have been colonized? Let me, yes? Besides the Reserve Bank, let's think more about constitutional law. Everything you've got in your study guide, in your textbook, in the material I've sent you. What, let's talk about Parliament. Parliament is the representative of the people, but for Parliament to work properly and independently as it should, the Constitution says that when a new Parliament is created after a general election, the members sitting in Parliament have a vote, A for the President, but they also get to vote for a Speaker of the National Assembly. And the Speaker of the National Assembly has this very important obligation of making sure that everything works as it should. Already, in Tutorial Letter 103, you will see two out of the three cases are against the Speaker of the National Assembly. Why? Because the Speaker of the National Assembly is colonized. Colonized by her membership of the African National Congress. She appears not to be able to separate her political affiliation from her task of national speaker or speaker of the National Assembly. What is the proof we have that she's been colonized? <laughs> she says it, yes. But besides that, something tangible. Yes. Well, let's start with the first case in the tutorial letter 103. Why did the economic freedom fighters and the Democratic Alliance have to go to the Constitutional Court against the Speaker of the National Assembly? Because, and this is of seminal significance, um, because... The public protector, Tuli Madonsela at that stage, had been asked by various people 
to conduct a thorough investigation into whether or not the president had unduly benefited by the Department of Public Works having done security upgrades at his Encantler residence, but that from what was seen is that many of those upgrades were not security related. So the cattle crawl, the swimming pool, the tuck shop, the amphitheater, I think they're more. They had absolutely no relationship with a security necessity. So the public protector undertook an investigation and as you know from section 182 of the constitution it says that the public, and public protector can and must investigate all of these allegations and she has far-reaching powers meaning she can actually subpoena a person and say you will come and tell me what happened even at the president she will say to him, come to my office on a certain date, at a certain time, give me the information. And then section 182b then goes on to say she can even make recommendations. A report about this doesn't end there though. Section 182.1c then says she must also then... Yeah, you know them. I know you know them like this. <laughs> you will by, by Monday, you'll know them like this. <laughs> that she must also actually give that report to the president, uh, not rather, well, to the president in this case because he was implicated, but to the National Assembly. So now let's be serious. If the Constitution gives these powers to the public protector, and if the Constitution says we are premised on the rule of law, which means that what the law says must be done, and if it's our taxpaying money that's used to support the public protector's office, to pay her salary, pay for all the costs, and she does her work well, and she formulates a report that says President Zuma must pay back a portion of the money, and she gives it to the National Assembly, logically, if we give an interpretation to the rule of law that everything that's in the Constitution must be given effect to, then the logical outcome should be that the National Assembly should have said to President Zuma, we, in receipt of this report, it says you need to pay back a portion of the money, please pay back the money. John, do you have a question? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, not yet. Did the National Assembly say this to President Zuma? No. No. What they did instead, and they, we have to cite Baleka Mbete as the speaker because it's her task to say, I've received this report, we are, I'm going to table it for discussion and debate on the 13th of December, whatever date, so all be here so we can discuss it. She didn't. What she did instead is she first created one little ad hoc committee and said, you go and look at this report. They came back and they said, yeah, we're not really sure if he should pay back. So then she created another ad hoc committee. They also said, well, maybe he should pay. What was happening all the time, though? Every time the EFF were in Parliament, they would say, pay back the money. And the money was not being paid back. That's why the DA, uh, well, EFF and then the DA joined them, had to go to the Constitutional Court. So you agree with me that the Speaker, in that instance, was effectively colonized. She was not thinking as an independent, neutral person, but she was trying her best to protect Jacob Zuma. We've seen that exact scenario playing out slightly differently when the State of the Nation Address happens. Because what happens at the State of the Nation Address is it is the President, who is Head of State and Head of the National Executive, coming before Parliament to account. Parliament is a distinct organ of state. And when the EFF start to chant pay back the money, and you're a constitutional delinquent, what did Baleka Mbete do? She called, well, before she chased them out. How did she chase them out? The police 
What do the police form part of? Executive. Do you agree with me? She was trying too hard to protect Jacob Zuma and not run Parliament as it should have been and use the Parliamentary Protection Services. Let's use the third example, the third case in your 103 as another example of colonization of, by the, of the Speaker of the National Assembly. The Constitution is pretty clear that the Speaker is given far-ranging powers to determine the proper workings of Parliament. So when the UDM said to her, we want to table a motion of no confidence, we want a secret ballot, she then came up with the very feeble excuse that she doesn't think she has the power to decide that. Now surely she does. In fact, the Constitution in Schedule 3 even mentions the fact that if, for example, the election for the president is undecided, it can be by secret vote. So there's already that idea in the Constitution that secret ballot is something acceptable and it might, it might be legitimate when necessary. She had to be taken to court to compel her to agree that she does actually have the power to decide whether or not it's a secret ballot. So I'm being quite harsh here on Baleka Mbete. She's not the only one. Max Sulu, the previous speaker, was also colonized because when Lindiwe Mazibuko said to him, we would like a vote of no confidence in President Zuma, he said, no, you're not, we're not doing it. So the, all of these cases I'm referring to are in your study guide at the end. He said, no, we're not, I'm not tabling it. And that compelled Lindiwe Mazibuko, in her capacity as the head of the DA, to go to the Constitutional Court and say to the court, please, will you just clarify this issue and make an order that if the Constitution says in Section 102 that a vote of no confidence can be held, then how can it be held if the Speaker says, I'm not dealing with it? And that's when the Constitutional Court said, it's part of our democratic process that the Speaker must at least table a vote of no confidence. She, he or she can't just ignore it. So we can see then, possibly, evidence of the colonization of the National Assembly because the Speaker who runs it is potentially colonized. What about the National Prosecuting Authority? Can we argue that they are potentially colonized? There's merit in arguing that they could be colonized because the decision that the 783 criminal charges should be reinstated against President Zuma hasn't gone anywhere. Sean Abrahams is sitting back giving Zuma time to say, no, reconsider my representations from eight years ago or let me make new representations. He's reluctant to do what his job description says he must do. Who else is colonized? We could argue that the current public protector is colonized. She doesn't seem to be as impartial and independent as previous public protectors, but we don't have a lot of evidence except for the Reserve Bank debacle. Yes, ESCOM's colonized. In fact, this whole, we could argue, this whole state is colonized by state capture. You don't agree? No, of course he doesn't. But do you see, yes? Yes? was a point where the constitution of the ANC seems to be um, running parallel with the constitution of the country. That's some of the obligations, like the cases that you have mentioned that they can speak of, that uh, she is a big problem. But also looking at the constitution of the organization or party that, is, that she would serve. Um, why am I outlining this? Is because the previous former president, uh, Kabombe, he 
you must remove just because of going against the, uh, the party wishes. Wouldn't that be also be an argument that one can put forward? Um, look, my, pro my difficulty with that is the fact that if the rule of law means that all law in the country, even the constitution of the ANC is law, must be compatible with the constitution, then they cannot contradict each other. And so, so the, yes, will you so tell me? Can, can one uh, take the constitution of the ANC versus the constitution of the country to declare it uh, to be inconsistent because now the case of the former president was left in and now it has also opened up here for the uh, Speaker of the National Assembly. Um, look, I'm not sure about, I mean, that's really political science dealing with the intricacies of how political parties manage their affairs sort of internally. Um, so I'm not, I must say I don't really have an answer about, well, what the speaker might or might not be afraid of from precedent having been set. All I'm really concerned about is, is all conduct by everyone, even in the ANC, just consistent with the Constitution and in the interests of the majority of us? So I, I must say I don't actually have an answer for you, I'm afraid. But perhaps it will come out later in our discussions. Um, so, what else, I mean, who else could we say is colonized? Well, possibly, but that's part of the whole state capture argument, that if colonization means a small minority seems to have immense control and has actually taken over the independent thought and autonomy of a group of people for their own benefit, that's colonization. And effectively, that's what we're seeing with state capture, that certain individuals seem to be benefiting immensely while the rest of us are being prejudiced because there's less money for social welfare issues and health issues. So you could argue that. But let's come then to the judicial branch that I've been not discussing until now, because we, we'll probably see here that the Judicial Service Commission is also colonized. Before you hesitate, let us discuss the judiciary. How you should approach any discussion about the judiciary is through the context of the counter-majoritarian dilemma. Because if we are a democracy, which we say we are, then it does appear to be undemocratic for a small number of unelected judges to have more power than 400 parliamentarians or more power than the elected president who we want to be our president. So you must be in a position to convincingly explain what the counter-majoritarian counter dilemma is and why it's actually not a dilemma. And I know that this stresses you out. Everyone hates the counter-majoritarian dilemma. It's actually not that difficult. It's literally a case of systematically taking the Constitution and saying, since we are a constitutional state, premised on the rule of law and the supremacy of the Constitution as contained in Section 1 and Section 2 of our Constitution. Therefore, all law and all conduct must be constitutional. And the judiciary is the third organ of the state that has specifically been established in order to make sure that all law and all conduct is constitutional. That is why the drafters of the Constitution expressly included Section 172, 
which says that the judiciary must, not may or can, must declare any law or conduct which is invalid, unconstitutional. So that's the starting point, that they must do that. And then you can elaborate and say, even though the 400 parliamentarians who are passing laws on our behalf and on, in our interests have the right to decide what's in our interests and what's good for us, they cannot do so without referring to us and receiving input or feedback from us and without actually caring about our interests. So every single law they pass must be constitutional and in our interests. And if it's not, then the judiciary must declare it invalid. Likewise, even though it's the president who has decided that he doesn't feel like re releasing the report on fee-free education and he's not going to comply with the recommendations contained in it, he doesn't have to anyway because it's only a commission of inquiry and we know that the decisions are not binding. But he should at least have reasons for not complying with it instead of just saying, well, I've already made up my mind that I'm going to in, in, implement someone else's recommendations. And it should be debated in a public forum where we can actually provide our input. Uh, so there too, even if it's the president, even the president is not above the law. And that's what I need you to know about the rule of law. The rule of law literally means that the law applies equally to every single person in the state, that no one is above the law, not even the president, and that the law can be given meaning or be interpreted by our constitutional courts, our courts with constitutional jurisdiction. I think you can also add that the decision of the SC is subject to the parliament. Yes, well, we, yes, we're coming there. In fact, that's a great point. Um, so the rule of law means that everyone must comply with the law. And therefore, yes? Can you apply section 9 The right to equality. It, that's, that is inherent in understanding that if everyone's equal before the law, no law can discriminate against women, for example. So yes, the equality clause. But equality in that context is sort of really dealing with if two people are in the same position and one's treated badly. I'm trying to get to the root of the fact that the law is there for a reason and everyone must comply with it. It, has, it should have the same effect on every single one of us, regardless of our circumstances. And then you must be able to explain that even though the judiciary is not elected, but has been appointed by the president after the JSC conducted its investigate, well, in interrogations, I like to say, and they've determined that the persons are fit and proper, suitably qualified, they have the requisite temperament, integrity, honesty, experience, then those persons can declare the law invalid. And now, of course, it looks as though it's turning democracy on its head, because in most cases, the second case in Tutorial Letter 103 is evidence of this, one judge, Bashir Valley, declared that the president's conduct is invalid. It looks as though one person has so much more power than our whole government, because here we've got President Zuma, head of the government, and yet, Bashir Valley can tell him you're doing the wrong thing. Why is it not undemocratic? Because what the judiciary is doing is merely reinforcing the Constitution and reinforcing democracy because the Constitution itself says it must make sure 
that if there's any infringement of the Constitution, it must declare it so, so that it can be rectified. And that brings us to the next point you need to make, is that because we have, in South Africa, separation of powers, the judiciary has been given these special powers to make sure that the constitutional system works. And this is where I want you to discuss or be able to discuss the fact that our separation of powers is decolonized. Because the case of De Lange versus Smuts, which is in your study guide and which is definitely discussed in your lecture material, it was in that case that the Constitutional Court said, in South Africa, we need to develop our own unique form of separation of powers. One that can meet the needs of the people by taking account of the historical past and making sure that that never happens again. So therefore, in future, the judiciary should be given enough power to be able not just to declare law or conduct invalid, but the judiciary can even go so far as to intervene into the workings of the legislature and workings of the judiciary if they need to. So the example for that is that, well, the, the, the default position is that the judiciary knows the limits of its powers and the judiciary will not unnecessarily intrude into the domain of the legislature or the executive, but it will if it needs to do that to uphold the Constitution. The best example is the, the Treatment Action Campaign case. And you probably have heard of it before, and it's certainly discussed in your material. What was the issue in the Treatment Action Campaign case? The issue was that women who were HIV positive and pregnant would invariably have the baby and the baby would be HIV positive as well because the HIV was transmitted. And the Indian government had been, well, a, far, a group of pharmacists had been developing drugs to deal with HIV and they had formulated a drug called nevirapine. This nevirapine was scientifically proven to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV by one tablet being taken. And the South African government kept, uh, the Department of Health kept saying, we can't provide nevirapine because we're not sure it's healthy and effective. We're not, we don't have enough financial resources to provide it. We don't have enough capacity in terms of human resources in the clinics to provide it, and it's just too difficult for us to do it. We can't do it. The Treatment Action Campaign, which is a non-governmental organization, which was working on providing action to counteract HIV, routinely wrote to the Department of Health saying, you must provide this nevirapine immediately. If you don't, we're going to go to court. And of course, when they didn't do it, and the TAC went to court, during the court case, the evidence that was led by the TAC is that, in fact, the, the Indian government had donated for free millions of these tablets to the South African government. So already they had the drug, but they were keeping them to the side. There was scientific proof that it was effective. There was already clinics all over South Africa that had the nurses who could administer it without any real issue. And because the Department of Health was found to be deliberately recalcitrant and obstructive and not complying with the right to health in the Constitution, the Constitutional Court had to make an order where they said, from right now, whether you like it or not, you will provide nevirapine. So you see that the, the judiciary will not tell the executive what to do. 
but they can do it if they have to. And that is not undemocratic, because it's democratic to give effect to the Constitution. But the reason why, essentially, the counter-majoritarian dilemma is not undemocratic, especially when it comes to the legislative process, is because you will never see the judiciary writing a law. They always know it's not their place to write the law. So when they declare a law invalid because it doesn't comply with the Constitution, they stop there and they say, therefore, National Assembly, you go and rewrite this law, or you create a new law, like in the case of Faree, when two women wanted to get married, but the Marriage Act said one man and one woman. It was a violation of Section 9 of the Constitution, Section 10 of the Constitution, dignity. And because the Constitutional Court said this is unconscionable, that if Section 9 of the Constitution says everyone, even same-sex partners should, or people with different sexual orientations, are to be protected, how can the law still discriminate against them? But still, the Constitutional Court didn't then come and start writing a law for itself. It said to Parliament, you are the lawmaking function. You draft the new law. And that's why within a year they drafted the Civil Union Act. So you see that it's not counter-majoritarian and it's not undemocratic because the judiciary is only doing what it is constitutionally obliged to do to uphold the Constitution. Um, I'm just trying to see what I'm missing out on. Okay, well, let us quickly talk about the Judicial Service Commission, then we can come back to other issues. So you're all familiar with the fact that we have a Judicial Service Commission established in terms of Section 178 of the Constitution, and its mandate is to ensure the integrity and independence of the judiciary. That's why it is composed of 23 persons, 15 of which are political figures, but some of those are political figures from opposition parties, so it should mediate any overt politicization of their decisions. And the other members are completely non-partisan, not members of political parties or not outwardly members of political parties, and they're there because of their expertise in law. So it's advocates and attorneys. So their task is to make sure that the right people are appointed as judges, and likewise that the people who are judges already, who are perpetrating any misconduct, are removed so that the judiciary is not impugned. And I say, or said, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, that the Judicial Service Commission is also seemingly colonized because in April 2008, a long time ago, when Judge Lope, a judge who knows what the Constitution says, he knows that Section 165 of the Constitution says the judiciary is independent, it must decide cases without fear, favor, prejudice, bias, and no one must interfere in the judiciary. Notwithstanding that, he went to judges in Kabinda and Jafta of the Constitutional Court, and his words were, it's in the material, you are our last hope. You must find in favor of our comrade. Never said anyone's name, but because this was just before an important case was about to be decided that related to President, well now President Zuma, they inferred that Judge Lope must only have been referring to President Zuma. Because the Constitutional Court is the highest court in the land and is the epitome of integrity and of giving effect to the Constitution, those two judges immediately said, we cannot accept this. And that's why they went to Chief Justice Pius Lunger at the time, and then a meeting was called, and all of the 11 judges said, 
we must write a complaint about this to the Judicial Service Commission. And they did. They outlined exactly what happened, what they deduced from it. They handed it over to the Judicial Service Commission. And what did the Judicial Service Commission do? Nothing. They have still, to date, done nothing. Judge Flaupe is still making decisions in the Western Cape High Court. He's the judge president of the Western Cape High Court. So you see that the, maybe it's because of the politicization that too many members of the JSC are political figures. But we cannot, in good conscience, accept the fact that a body that's supposed to uphold the integrity of the judiciary is failing in its task. And it's not just Judge Flaupe. Mabel Janssen, a judge making obscene remarks to the effect, if I can even remember that, all 12, by 12 years old, all black women have been raped. <laughs> Never been, yes, exactly. She made various comments like that. Judge Mokola Mota Motata, I think his name is, caught drunk driving and then making racial slurs. Nothing happened to him. Norbo did nothing wrong. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Uh, well, we will. We'll, we could come to that possibly, but I mean, Gorbo's case was. And I, I'm glad you raised it. Actually, I mean, the situation with Gorbo was simply about the president understanding when he can appoint a chief justice or when he can renew the term of a chief justice, and the president didn't consider or didn't consult with the JSC as he was supposed to, the president just woke up one day and said, Sandile Ngobo, you're taking over again, next, another term. And that's when, that's the point you were making, I think it's coming to this, even decisions of the JSC are reviewable. And that's why, when the JSC did nothing about John Clope, immediately, Freedom Under Law, a non-governmental organization, went to court. They said, we need an order that it is unconstitutional for the JSC not to have fulfilled their mandate. And a court order was granted that the JSC must institute an inquiry. And also, um, well, one of the intricacies about that case is that the JSC was fortunate that they could at least rely on the fact that at the time, their rules didn't really clearly provide for, the, for how to deal with misconduct. It had been stated that they can deal with misconduct, but they didn't really know how to do it. So then the court said, you will amend your rules. And they did amend the rules, and now they've got a judicial conduct tribunal. So it's ready to hear the Flaupe case. Still hasn't. And that's why at the begin before this semester even started officially, I placed a document, a little short extract on my UNISA, just telling you, that here we are, what's it, eight years down the line, and every so often when the DA or whoever it is says, when are you going to deal with the Flaupe case? They say, soon. Soon. <laughs> they still haven't. All right. So I don't know if you agree it's colonization, but there's something untoward there. Um, the point I need to make, though, in relation to our discussion, and I started discussing the public protector and the fact that she has these immense powers to investigate and therefore her recommendations must be given effect to. The conclusion of the economic freedom fighters versus Speaker of the National Assembly case, the, what you must derive from that case, and I've put it in the commentary, and I think on page 27 it is, I quote there, paragraph 31 of the judgment, where the court said, the president exists, has his being, and lives in the Constitution, meaning that even he is not above the Constitution, and that even he is not allowed to unduly benefit, and therefore, where that the finding of the public protector is binding and enforceable. That's why he did pay back a portion of the money. 
It's not? Isn't it? Well, he, uh, he made an uh, announcement and he said he went to the vendor mutual bank or something. So he has, he has had to comply. Well, I, I, I'm, he does, and even when he does, he sort of skirts many of the issues. Um, but he did have to go to Parliament and say, and Parliament, even though he wasn't addressing us, he was addressing Parliament who represents us, and he did say, I've now taken a loan and I've paid back the money. Yes, it had to be confirmed. There was this supposed evidence. So we're coming now, I think, to the most important part of our discussion today. <laughs> Is, is this. If the president, okay, sorry, let me just carry on with the party protector quickly. You have to, I, why I'm telling you that the personal is political and that you need to, you know, take ownership of our constitution. One of the distinct benefits of the public protector is it's free, that's most important, and now the decisions are binding. It means that you can tell your clients, your friends, family, if they've suffered any prejudice from the government, say to them, don't go to court. Yeah? There was a person that I was talking to about this and he said, He was falsely advised to take a um, already signed extension. And then he came to my office. And I said to him, Look, um, go to the public sector bank. It's, it's free and it's, um, it's, it's effective. But now, you were told that you paid in that case to be referred to your mortgage company. That can choose you when you talk to your company. And when he went to the court, they said to me, Look, that, that might be because he should have exhausted other remedies that he would have had while he was still in the police. Because the public protector is supposed to be sort of a last resort if you've tried to deal with the matter yourself. You know, this list why he was in the hospital. Which public no, well, I mean, that's one example, and I don't know why that happens. There should have been reasons given. Um, but the point is, you need to be able to inform people that there's this non-judicial platform. So it's not as emotionally draining and stressful, and it's free. And you should be able to get recourse because the decisions are now unequivocally binding. The Constitutional Court said... We are going to put this issue to rest once and for all because up until then, people kept saying, oh, we're not sure if it's binding, we're not going to comply. Yes? The SABC versus... Yes, that's why. That, that, you see, that was a high court decision. SABC where, versus the DA where the court skipper, I think it was skippers, said, I'm not really sure if public protectors' decisions are binding. So there was confusion for many years, and that's why the EFF case is so fundamental because it has now clarified unambiguously that the findings are final and binding. But and then how do we offer as a public, as a public protector? How do we do what? Sorry? How do we make the public, how do we keep that Well, yes, unfortunately, then you would have to go to court because judicial review 
of all of these kinds of decisions is permissible, even the decisions of the public protector. If you disagree with it, you can go to court. Like the point you were making, even the decisions of the Judicial Service Commission are reviewable. That's because our whole constitutional system is premised on accountability, openness, responsiveness. Now that brings me to the point I was about to make, which is, even the president is always accountable. So we know that just two weeks ago, Bladen Zimande was fired. But in March, when President Zuma decided to shuffle his cabinet, interestingly, Section 91, Subsection 2 does say the president can appoint and dismiss his cabinet members. But does that mean he can do as he pleases, when he pleases? Principle of legality, yes. What does the principle of legality mean? Before we get to rationality even. The principle of legality, yes, rule of law, but principle of legality actually falls within it. Because the rule of law is that the president can dismiss, the president did use it, or try to use it, to say, well, I've got the free right to do as I please. But if you understand the rule of law as including the principle of legality, which means that everything that anyone does must actually have a basis, a connection with, some, with the Constitution and be legitimate. So because the DA then went to court and said, the president has shuffled his cabinet and we don't know why, and we are not happy with it. The president did say, but I can do that in terms of section 91.2. And the, the high court, Gauteng North High Court here in Pretoria, and its decision is in the 12.103. They said, based on our constitutional system, which is premised on the rule of law, principle of legality, the way in which to ascertain that the president's conduct is actually lawful is to invoke the concept of the rationality principle, which you might have come across in administrative law. And rationality simply means, is there a logical connection between what the president is allowed to do and what he has done? and the consequences thereof. So that is why the DA went to court in that case. They said, there does not seem to be any real valid reason why President Zuma shuffled his cabinet and removed Praveen Gordon. Why, why did the DA go to court? They went because some people said that there was this intelligence report. We've never seen it. We didn't know what it said. And more importantly, as soon as Praveen Gordon was fired, our economy was downgraded to junk status. Junk status. Yes. <laughs> and that has serious consequences for our entire economy and therefore all of us. Property, yes. If your property is money, and now you've suddenly lost a whole lot of money because the interest has been depleted because the junk status, or you can't... Yes, well, that's a, a consequence of the fact that Praveen, who was seen to be a reasonable minister of finance who was doing the right things according to the international community. And therefore, what the lesson is that you need to draw from the DA versus president case, is that the judiciary was able and entitled to review the president's decision. They didn't tell President Zuma, you've done the wrong thing, how dare you do that, put Praveen Gordon back. All they did is they said, because you are the president and you have an obligation in terms of Section 83 to defend, to respect, and to uphold this constitution, you need to give this court the reasons and the record 
upon which you relied when you removed Praveen Gordon and reshuffled your cabinet. He's never done it, unfortunately. But the principle remains that even the president must always be accountable to us and tell us why he's done something so that we can agree or not agree, but to have at least have an opportunity to know. So that principle of rationality, the principle of legality, accountability, democracy, is supposed to permeate your understanding of how everyone in government or in the legislature and even in the judiciary are supposed to function. That's why the court judgments are long and provide extensive reasons because we have the right in South Africa to know why the courts made those decisions. And we are even allowed to criticize them if we think they're wrong. And that's why the parties to those cases can appeal. So the Oscar Pistorius case, which is topical, is in the process of being appealed because it's alleged that Judge Masipa made a mistake. Judges are inf not infallible. All right, so I think that's covered quite a lot of our discussion today. Yes? I'm well, it, it doesn't speak to it. It just says he can yes. appoint and dismiss, and we have to infer that he can. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Well, absolutely. The president is not above the law. And that's why the president has now been set in SAFU, as you point out, that the president can also provide evidence in court. He, yes, obviously, then they do try to give do regard to his schedule, so which I think his schedule is pretty full, though, with all the court appearances. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, yes? Sorry, John? Sorry, uh, there was another question behind you. Sorry. Yes? I went to the Masia case in SSK where the people of the country said you cannot you know, try someone on oh, yeah. you, you understand. So I'm mm. just confused if that's what that was for them needs to be tried on the law that is not even applicable at the time when they frustrated the Look, that's a brilliant question, but to my mind, if the constitution has always said that the JSC can deal with misconduct, then if it was a case of misconduct and he can be removed, that, he, that was already clear, there was already the law in place. It's just the technicalities of the procedure to be followed that was had to be amended. But the actual literal law saying he can be removed for misconduct was already in place. So the nulla pune sine lege rule can't apply in that case to him, and he, he must be aware of it. Uh, he, and he'd violated Section 165, so that was unambiguous. So the, just the method of how he's going to be tried doesn't actually go to the heart of whether or not it was a crime at the time, or it was an offense. Okay, so we've only got two real 
big things to deal with, and then we're done. Those two things are what we've already, well, one of them we've already mentioned quite a lot of, and we know well. So you'll see that when it comes to our discussion about accountability, how do we keep the president accountable? Well, motion of no confidence is one option. So just be logical about this. You've seen it on TV. You've heard about it. That there are actually two distinct methods that can be used to remove a president. And section 89. So yes, I've already mentioned the Lindiwe Mazibuko versus Maxisulu Speaker of the National Assembly case. What was the principle in that case? The principle is that the Speaker must table it. So be alive to procedures, meaning how can it be done? How, how is it that it's done? Can you or I walk up to the Speaker and say, hey, I'd like an impeachment vote? No, it's got to be someone in Parliament representing us who will officially table the vote, and it'll either be in terms of section 89, which is impeachment, or a section 102 vote, which is a vote of no confidence. And they are different. We'll come to those differences now. So the, the procedurally, it must be tabled. Procedurally, from the UDM case, the newest one, that the speaker is equally entitled to decide whether it will be by secret ballot or not. So if you need to explain to someone how this works, you must be logical. Um, what else can we say? We can say that there is the fundamental difference between a Section 89 method and a 102 method. What is that difference? Is that the Section 89 method of removing the president is invoked when there is Evidence of serious violation of the Constitution or the law by the President, evidence of misconduct, or evidence of incapacity or inability to perform his functions because he might have had a heart attack or become unwell and not be able to actually perform his tasks, but he's still alive. The 89 method is quite objective in that if there is this clear unequivocal evidence of the violation of the Constitution or the law, then it can be invoked. And I know that there's a lot of emphasis, I think I'm, maybe I said it in the lecture notes or I've said it somewhere, but that there must be a court case proving the violation. That's not absolutely true because there doesn't have to be. But we do have, as a result of the EFF case, evidence that the president violated the Constitution by not complying of his own free will with the findings of the public protector to pay back the money. Yeah? But does that constitute serious violation? Yes. <laughs> it is a serious violation. When you are the person, in fact, Schedule 2 of the Constitution says that when the, and we've probably seen this, at the inauguration of the president, there the chief justice is overseeing it and all the foreign dignitaries are there and the thousands of people at the union building watching the president be inaugurated, he's got to swear on oath that he will defend and respect and uphold the constitution. And if he does, does not do that strictly and to the letter, it's a serious violation, particularly when he has benefited unduly by millions of rands. Uh, so that's relatively easy to prove. What isn't so easy, however, is the vote itself. Because what is the requirement for a Section 89 removal? Two thirds, that's 66.6%. .6 and in numbers, 267 out of 400 must vote in favor of it. How likely is that when 245 or 249 of the members are already ANC members, only 89 are DA and only 25 are EFF? It's unlikely. 
That's why it has not succeeded thus far. Well, possibly it's because our whole parliament is colonized by its political affiliation and can't distance itself from the constitutional objective. Yeah, it probably does, but I mean, it also, it's just indicative of the majority will. If we voted for the ANC and we wanted Zuma as president, he shouldn't be removed too easily at the same time. So parliament has to be alive to the wishes of the people and the, they have to therefore vote. And that's why in the UDM case, where there was a lot of mention of the members of parliament voting along, along the, the lines of their conscience, at the same time, they can't separate their political affiliation and the commitments they've made to the party. That's, so it's, it's always going to be complex. That's why I was also trying to put in the case of the speaker. To say, if members are required to vote, then they should have Well, I think she she should vote with her conscience and try not to align herself too closely with her political affiliation. But I don't think anyone can dis can separate their political opinions so clearly. All right, so that's the eighty nine. We've seen that it's difficult because of the two thirds majority requirement. But it also shouldn't be difficult if you see that objectively, if you've complied with the requirement that he has violated the Constitution, he should be removed. But because it is not easy, and because we know that politically the president is there because the party wants him there and the people through the party want him there, if he has lost the support of his party, that is when section 102 is invoked. And what is different about section 102? Well, yes, there's no requirements that have to be met. It's simply a case of has he lost the majority sort of opinion and part in the political party that he should be president? They don't like this time. They said it's political. What's even more difficult about section 102 is that when he is removed, well, that's what I want to get to, too. We're getting to that. Thank you very much. So 102, what is the requirement? You've already mentioned it. It's only a simple majority, which means 50% plus only one extra vote. Not 51%, 50 plus one. So it's easier to attain, but still not easy in our constitutional system. And now, think about it rationally. What happens then when the president hypothetically is voted out of office through Section 89? If it's because he violated the Constitution or is guilty of misconduct, should he be entitled to a pension and to lifetime medical aid? No. That's why the Constitution says he doesn't get any benefits. If it's due to ill health, it's not his fault. He can continue to receive the benefits. What is another consequence if the president is removed? Well, that precisely. But in terms of the working of the National Assembly, they being cabinet members. They also have to resign from their offices as, mem uh, as cabinet members because it was that president that put them in that position. They still continue to be members of parliament. There's nothing saying that they are now, they are now 
unemployed and have nothing to do, but they take their positions again as ordinary members of parliament, and the democratic, uh, sorry, the democratic process that's followed then is that the deputy president for 30 days becomes the president, and the condition is that within the 30 days expiring, a new election has to be held within Parliament where a new president is appointed because that new president appoints a new cabinet. Mm -hmm. because when, when we are on that subject, uh, when, we, when I was reading through page 187 of the prescribed book, there's a misleading uh, somewhere in that book, uh, page 187. Yes. And, uh, 197, you say? When it says the powers and functions of the deputy president are in section 85 of the section 86. Yes. Of the Constitution, of which is the because section 82 speaks about the safety of the head. About the? Safety of the head. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. No, you're quite right. Um, yes, no, I, I see that is an error. Thank you. I will address it. Um, okay. Yeah, that will be addressed. Thank you. But notwithstanding that, um, so you see that the deputy president does perform an important function because he has to become president when the president is removed through section 89. Yes. Yes, I know that is interesting. Um, well, th th that's well interesting and in fact the wording of the constitution is, when, and this is now when it's a 102 removal uh, because the person has lost the support of his party. It says the deputy president will ordinarily become the acting president. So it does leave room for the speaker, who's supposed to be neutral and independent and impartial, to fulfill the role. It says where there's no one who can be found. Yes, if there's no minister appointed there, And the th why, why that is a, po a, a good option is because the deputy president is also known as the person responsible for government business. So the, the, he's still got to fulfill his role. And if now the deputy president becomes the president for those 30 days, a lot of the stuff that has to happen might not happen. So it's in, the, in a situation like that, probably better to just continue with the status quo for the 30 days where the speaker can become de facto president and the deputy president continues as deputy president because they know that there's going to be a new election in 30 days' time. But and then... That also matter, uh, because it says that um, it had that maybe it had been dismissed in terms of section 182, the person Um, it doesn't say that expressly. It just says if the National Assembly votes to remove the president, then the president and other members of the cabinet must resign. It doesn't refer specifically to the fact that... Um, Uh, resumption of office. Isn't that 83, 84? No. 88? Term of office of the president? Yes. Um, well, it doesn't refer then to the deputy. It just says no person may hold office as president for more than two terms. And that acting position... Um, is not regarded as 
existing exactly. as a term. So then right. the person, say for example, the Cyril Ramaphosa, who now for the next two months, for example, has to act as president. That doesn't prohibit or prevent him from being able to become president and still fulfill two full terms because that acting time is not counted as part of presidency because it's only an acting position. It could easily be, yes. That is the thing. And that person's not prohibited at all from officially becoming elected. They're just in a kind of a, I don't know, acting position for a temporary period of time. Yeah? Yes, of course. They sh definitely should because it's such an important position. So now, is there anything that I haven't said that you think Yes. Um, well, the deputy president is actually, he is, but it's, it's, it's a different kind of, he's, he's not really regarded strictly as a member of cabinet. That's why he's got this term of the leader of government business. He's not really strict, because he's, he's not a minister. And, but he is appointed, he or she is appointed by the cabinet. Yes, but it's, it's not, he's not a cabinet member. So he's, he's so when also, the cabinet minister sent a deputy minister to resign after the two terms of the you didn't that he or she or she has Well, they, he should resign and perhaps then take the position of acting president, because you can't fulfill both at the same time. So he sh ordinarily should resign as well so that he could become the pres active president. But in the, op the situation where the speaker becomes president, he can continue to be deputy president because he's not officially but cabinet he, member in the literal... Because if you resign, I mean, to me, the word resign Um, I'm not really understanding your question well, the sorry. The president yeah? needs to be appointed by the president. Now, if the president has been moved by the process which is uh, contained in section 102, subsection 2, now, the question was that, uh, shouldn't the deputy president also resign? And he responded by saying he should resign. He should, but he doesn't, he's not legally obliged immediately to resign. Now, yes, what I wanted to understand is, Oh well, I would I would assume we've never seen this in practice, but I would assume that what would happen is there would already have been discussions by the political party about what's going to happen, and if not, because we're a democracy, Parliament itself would have to discuss this with all the opposition parties mem present as well, all participating, so that the most democratic succession takes place. Say that again. Internal procedures that are largely politically driven, but as long as it looks accountable and open, that everyone is agreement that this is the majority decision. The majority of our representatives in Parliament have decided that X person should be the new acting president if they have serious grievances with the Speaker being president or with the Deputy President being Speaker. Then, really, the only last thing that we need to consider in our diagram is that part on the bottom right hand of it. So your assignment question had a question about cooperative government. All you need to be able to explain, well not all, but understand is that we have the three distinct interdependent but independent spheres and they work together for the common good of the country. So therefore, they're supposed to cooperate with each other, not compete with each other. And that is why we have rules stipulating 
how best they should work together. And those rules are actually straightforward. Imagine the scenario. In the daily workings of the state, we know that the national sphere, our parliament is passing laws. And they pass laws that are uniformly applicable to the whole country. And those are usually a general framework that everyone can comply with. But because each of the nine provinces are different and have different needs, and because each municipality has fundamentally different needs, the Constitution does give the provincial sphere and the local sphere quite a lot of autonomy to draft laws for itself. So that's why we have a provincial legislature where the provincial legislature can draft laws that only apply to Gauteng. And then the municipality can draft laws that only apply to Tuane Metropolitan Municipality, for example. Because it's got nothing to do with... with sorry? With the greater yes, or with, with another municipality. Because our circumstances might be very different. We, for example, might not need to charge as much for property rates because there's so many people living at enough money is is um, raised for the basic services. So there can be a bylaw only operating in Chwane about the property rates and how much they are charged. Whereas another municipality will have to charge a completely different price um, to the customers. So now, even though the rule of law and constitutionalism means that all laws must be compatible with each other. There is a possibility that the law passed by the province or by the municipality is going to contradict the national law. It might happen. So you need to know how you resolve it. And there are two simple rules of how you resolve it. The first Simple rule is you must ask yourself, is this the kind of matter that has the right or insubstantial measure can be validly passed by both the national sphere and this provincial or local sphere? That is called a concurrent competence. They both have the equal right to pass this kind of law competence. And you find the concurrent competencies in Schedule 4 of the Constitution. Now, you obviously are going to go into the, into the exam without the Constitution with you. So think about it logically. What kind of things do you think would be concurrent competencies? Sorry. Yes, things that are going to have eff an effect on the national sphere and, of course, everything else. Yes? Economy. Uh, yes, economy will invariably be that. You said something? Sorry? Parks. No, parks. Think about it. Does the park in Cape Town have anything to do with us? No. Not at all. So that would be an exclusive competence. So the things that deal with the local sphere and the provincial sphere and the national sphere all sort of of the same importance. Those are a concurrent competence. Environment, as you pointed out, health services. There is no way that health, for example, can be dealt with differently at the local level than the national level because we have minimum standards. Everyone is supposed to get the same services as far as health care, as far as education as well. Uh, no, that's certainly not a concurrent competence. So it doesn't, no one else cares about the refuse removal in Chwane. And likewise, we don't care about the refuse removal in any other municipality. Uh, things like language policy. I mean, these are things that will automatically apply uniformly in the state. So that's a concurrent competence. So all the Constitution says is, if, for example, the municipality, when passing its bylaw, has decided 
to come up with some system that is really not compatible with the national law. How you decide which of the two laws prevails is by looking at section 146 of the Constitution. And section 146 is actually logical. It's a long section, but it, it can be understood logically. If you just approach it from the, the sort of thinking that I'm trying to convey here to you, which is this. If the national law is one which does apply uniformly across this country already, yes it does, it doesn't say it's not going to apply uniformly, and it's a kind of law that already stipulates minimum standards. That's the minimum. No one can go lower than that. And if that national law already provides a framework, so the Public Procurement Framework Act on exactly how tenders can be awarded, then it's a national law. A province can't suddenly come and say, oh no, we're not going to comply with that law. We want our own tender processes that are unconstitutional. And if the national, or the, the national law that's in place is consistent with national policy, national policy, let's use, and that's why the personal is political document starts with the 2014 white paper on secondary education or post-secondary education. That's a policy. And so that policy is that education must be free, fair, open, accessible, learner-centered, that educated lecturers must teach the students and you can't just have people who don't hopefully know what they're talking about teaching you. So that's already the first part. That's logical, isn't it? If you know that the national law is uniform, got the framework, got the inherent policies of the state ingrained into it, then that one should prevail. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say in section 146, if the national law that's already there, that's the minimum standards, etc., also specifically provides for things of like national security or economic unity or the common market for the mobility of goods and services. So in other words, that provinces cannot erect a kind of a border where if you're bringing goods from Durban at the port to Joburg, suddenly now Durban says the truck can only get into the next province if you pay a toll. Not a, not a toll for roads, but a, a, a tariff that's unacceptable in terms of the national law. Then, of course, the national law should prevail. So that's what it means by if this other law is infringing on the mobility of goods and services, then that other law should not be able to survive. And of course, if the, the last two, or last three rather, if generally the national law also protects the economic integrity of the province, then the, the national law, if it infringes on that, should not be able to exist. And the last two, if the national law provides for the promotion of equal opportunity and equal access to government services, then that's the law that should prevail. Because it might be that a province says only this group of people can get social welfare. That would be automatically invalid. And then the last one is protection of the environment. So that confirms that it's a concurrent issue and therefore, even though the municipality can pass a bylaw on the environment, or even the province can pass a bylaw on the environment, it cannot provide for less protection than the national law. So the point I'm making here, as the Constitution says in Section 146, is if any of these uh, factors are relevant and it's apparent that the provincial law or the local law infringes on this national law that already provides for the mobility of goods and services and the environment and the economic unity of the state or national security, then the national law must prevail. It's higher up on the hierarchy for the reason that it's already uniformly applicable and therefore the province can't 
deviate from those national standards. It's slightly different, very slightly different only, when it's an exclusive jurisdiction or competence. And now you literally just think, as we've just had the discussion, what things would be in the exclusive competence of a municipality, for example? Parks, beaches, dog licensing, refuse removal. They only apply in this particular municipality. And that's why the municipality has extreme or immense power to draft a bylaw. But that bylaw can be declared invalid if it's not consistent with the national law. So the national government might come along and say, sorry for you, we don't approve of this bylaw, we are intervening. So intervention is allowed. The only time that the national government can intervene, and I say national government, but even the provincial, because the national and provincial are seen to both have a monitoring role over the municipalities. So that's why I said part A of Schedule 4 and part A of Schedule B deal with national and provincial as one, and then local as B. Because the municipality is independent, autonomous, but it needs to be watched and monitored and supervised. And so the rule, if there's this, such, let's use that example from your um, study guide, the revolting one, where the municipality says, we don't have enough money to remove refuse every week, so we're only going to do it every month. Now that's hideous, obviously. And you can imagine the ramifications. So the national or provincial government is immediately, as soon as they see that this is happening, they are going to intervene. And the municipality is going to say, hold on, it's our exclusive competence, how dare you intervene? Health, yes, we're going to get to that. You have to be able to systematically prove all the reasons why the intervention is necessary. So your starting point would be to identify the issue. What is the issue? Is whether or not the national sphere or the provincial sphere, you can, depends on the, whatever the factual scenario is, has the right to intervene and override the bylaw, the local law. And once you've established that, and so this is the system that I'm talking to now is called FIRAC. You can use it, you don't have to. FIRAC literally means, what are the facts? What is the issue? What is the rule of law, yes? A is, that's where you get the majority of your marks. And then C is conclusion, which you can even ignore if your application's good enough. So, yes. F is fact, but you certainly don't have to repeat the fact. But why I tell you about the facts is because you'll see that the personal political document is political document starts by saying that students who come out of secondary education suffer from not being able to comprehend what they read at university. So you have to read often the facts over and over to understand exactly what is material and what is relevant. So many students don't seem to understand the question and then they answer the wrong thing. So, facts. But you don't, uh, John, do you need assistance? Oh, he's on the phone. Okay. So your facts, you don't have to restate any facts. You just have to be able to find the right facts so that you can integrate them in your application section. So facts, issues, or issue. What is the issue to be decided? So the issue in the EFS case, the court said the issue is whether or not the findings of the public protector are legally binding. So issue. Identify the issue. Then, be, I, I, I mean, this could work for you. You don't have to use the system uh, literally. But the next thing is, what is the law you're going to use? So the R stands for rule of law. And usually the rule of law would be the particular provision of the Constitution. In this scenario, it would be section 147 of the Constitution, as read with Schedule 5, because Schedule 5 is the provision dealing with exclusive competencies, and then any relevant case that you think is going to be relevant later on. So, rule of law is the third one. 
Then the majority of your marks come from the application part, where you take the law and you apply the facts to it to logically and coherently say, because the law says X, Y, Z, and the facts prove that, as we'll come to, that the, it's harmful to the environment, therefore, the national law can override the local or provincial law. So how you can know whether or not the national law can override it is by looking at section 147 of the Constitution. And section 147 literally just says, if there is this conflict between the national sphere law and the provincial or well, local law, and it's a matter where there's already a law in place, similar to what, what was held in section 46 about a national law in place, but where section 147 differs is that section 147 directs you to section 44.2 of the Constitution, which are the provisions that are of overriding importance to the state, and therefore these are the factors that will help you decide whether or not the national government should intervene and override rule the Yes, the national government, I mean, that's why we have a national parliament. It really is supposed to be doing the main task of drafting the laws. The kind of case law, and I mean, really, this is open. The kind of case law that would be relevant in a situation like this is using the wording in the Constitution, where the Constitution uses the term, is it necessary for the national sphere to override the provincial or local sphere? So case law where the word necessary has been used are cases like Doctors for Life. Is it necessary for a law to be reformulated because there was no public participation? Is it necessary? So that's probably one of the only cases I'm really aware of where you could say it's necessary for there to be an a intrusion or an intervention. But it's more likely that the factual scenario is where you'll get your marks from, and as long as you've got some authority. So section 44 then, two, is virtually identical to what was held in section 146. So you, if you have a good understanding of those, you should be fine. So 44.2 says, Parliament may intervene if it is necessary, so there's the word necessary, to maintain national security. We've already seen that in 146. If it's necessary to maintain economic unity, those don't look relevant in the context of refuse removal. But C, 22C, says if it's necessary to maintain essential national standards. Now, national standards, there would invariably be a national law that says that refuse shall be removed as quickly as possible. It's a national standard. But then 442D is more particular. It says, if it's necessary for the national legislature to intervene to ensure that the minimum national standards for rendering of services is complied with. Service delivery includes refuse removal. So now we're seeing it's definitely necessary. If refuse is only removed once a month and not once a, a week, it's necessary for national, national law to be passed so that it intervenes to ensure service delivery, proper service delivery. And then the final one is if it's necessary to prevent unreasonable action taken by a province or local government, 
which is prejudicial to the interests of another province or the country as a whole. And here is where you use your critical thinking skills. What would logically happen if refuse is only removed once a month instead of once a week? The environment would most certainly be negatively affected and prejudiced. And you would have to explain that the refuse piling up would pollute the environment. In particular, it would pollute the waterways. Those waterways are invariably going to traverse another province. Therefore, it's going to affect and be prejudicial to other provinces and to the country as a whole. If there's refuse piling up, it's probably going to cause things like cholera. That could become a national issue if there is cholera being transmitted. So you really have to just think about it logically. When would it be reasonable, rational, and necessary for the national legislature to override the powers that have been constitutionally conferred on the province or on the municipality to draft a law for itself. If it's necessary to maintain national standards, protection of the environment, then it should be done. Um, so that's really what you should derive from that Discussion on the right hand side of your page. Yes, section 44. 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 Section 44 as we all are. It's this. In line with the discussion I've just had with you about whether national government can delegate lawmaking to the province or to the municipality, or whether it can override a law that's already been passed, that question of the powers of the national government to delegate lawmaking function. Do, are you aware of the distinction between delegation of original law making function and delegation of making subordinate legislation? Explain it to us, please. <laughs> I, I'm going to disagree only for the fact that, well, there's another question here in the back, yes? No, 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 I, I just wanted to say that uh, the Commissioner legislator has authority to, to make things on legislation. Yes. But they are allowed to keep the legislation, subordinate legislation, like regulation. That's exactly what I want to hear, yes. So Absolutely. That's the what I want you to understand. And this is relevant in the case of the Executive Council of the Western Cape case where Nelson Mandela as president then, even though he was head of the executive, he 
amended a law giving himself the power to change municipal boundaries in the Western Cape for elections. And I want you to realize then that it's not the executive's task to pass law. It's the legislature's task. That's why original legislation is the Constitution, but it's also other acts of Parliament properly passed by the National Assembly. But because the National Assembly passes the law, and we know that the law, even the Constitution, is really just a skeleton, in order for that law to come alive and to be implemented by the executive, someone with the particular knowledge should be mandated to draft the subordinate legislation that does bring the act into life. And those, that is where regulations are the subordinate legislation. So you'll often find this is the Refugees Act and these are the regulations accompanying it. The regulations are the kind of the substance that deal with all the nitty gritty or intricate detail of exactly how a person is determined to be a refugee, what the processes are that are followed, because the act itself might be quite vague. And that's how the acts are intended, because the executive is really the one who's going to bring it to life, and they have to then decide how to do it. And that's why the Minister of Education or Health is usually, it says in the act, the minister responsible for this portfolio will bring into effect regulations to give really context to the, the legislation. So that's where there can be a delegation of, of lawmaking power, but only if it's to make subordinate legislation. Certainly not to make original legislation. All right, are we all happy with that? Yes, those are original because the constitutional uh, constitution confers original legislative power on the legislature to come up with the laws. Yes. All right. Are you all happy with that? Yes. Okay, there was just a question here about, is there a difference between spheres of government and levels of government? Okay, don't you want to say? Oh, yes. The, the simple answer is there is a fundamental difference between the two. Why? Because when in the... Interim constitution, and, and particularly in during the apartheid era, local government was not regarded as having any, yes, yeah? When can the function of the law making be delegated? We missed that. Oh, yes, okay. Well, when it is a delegation by the national parliament to a provincial government or to a municipality to pass a law, like an actual law, an act, then there's nothing wrong with the delegation because it's being delegated to another body that is a legislative body. But when the law that needs to be passed is not an act per se, but is regulations which are made to bring the law to life and to enable the law to be implemented, then that can be delegated to the executive because the executive has the particular expertise and knowledge about how best to bring the law to life. And that's why the minister responsible for that portfolio is told, you draft the regulations, and therefore it's the executive passing those subordinate laws. Is that okay? 
Okay, the, the, the question that was asked here is, is there a difference between spheres of government and levels of government? The answer is yes, a fundamental difference. Because when we used to refer to levels of government, it meant that in terms of hierarchy, the municipality had absolutely no powers of its own. Everything it tried to do and wanted to do, it had to keep saying to national government, can we do this? Give us money for this. Please, can we do that? And because that was unsustainable, that's not true to our integrated quasi-federal system where the three spheres have independence and their own powers in terms of the constitution. It was done away with and replaced with spheres so that the municipality can create its own wealth by raising taxes, by charging people for parking in the streets, for example, uh, if it does. Dog licenses, it might say, your dog is going to cost you 500 rand <laughs> or whatever. Um, and that's how the municipality can deal with, run itself. It's autonomous. It's not having to keep saying to provincial government, give us some money, please. It's supposed to then be able to function by itself because the constitution says we have the third sphere which is responsible for service delivery. And they must do that. So they must be able to get the money in to provide the services. So yes, there's a difference. <laughs> okay, anything else? Yes? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, that if, and this is really my conclusion that I, I don't know why the Constitutional Court didn't <laughs> use this kind of thinking in their judgment, but if we have a constitution, and I think I might have referred to it, that says we have a public protector, says she can investigate, says she can report, then surely the decisions she makes should be enforced. Because otherwise, it's in fact, the Constitutional Court did say, say this. Otherwise, you've, the Constitution has created a wholly ineffective institution. Yeah. And that is nonsensical. It's irrational. So yes, the rule of law does apply because it means that we, there's this estab constitutionally established body with specific powers that are in the Constitution itself and supplemented by the Public Protector Act. She does everything in terms of the law, and therefore we must comply with that. Because the law says we must comply with decisions made by any organ of state. And an organ of state does include, in this context, a public protector, which is using public money to function. That's really the rationale, is that all properly arrived at decisions must be given effect to. So the rule of law does permeate everything in constitutional law. So are you all satisfied with that? You think we're okay? <laughs> yes? Uh, regarding the exams, Ms. Stone, we know we're going to get MCQs and then we have three other questions. But I, what I want to know, can we expect one question that will be 50 marks, for example, and other two <laughs> questions <laughs> will <won't> consist of... <laughs> Short no, I, I don't know where, it, where you got the idea that there's three questions. It just says, oh, oh, okay, no, well, the answer is the 80 remaining marks after the MCQs are long questions, either out of 10 marks, 12 marks, 15 marks, or 20 marks. So they're long Essays or theory or problem questions. Yes. Yes. Let me. Let me. I'll repeat it. I'm sorry. You. Yes. The answer is this. Of the remaining eighty marks, you will have. Questions that are either out of 10 marks or 12 marks or 15. Uh, she's gone again, I think. Okay, what? 
inside the line, then the process of passing it on the boundary of the line is going to mean the 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 Ten marks, or twelve marks, or fifteen marks, or twenty marks. So there are a number of questions. <laughs> I'll email. She'll have to email me. Well, in fact, the, it's actually not difficult at all. All you need to know is it's the JSC, which is fundamentally responsible for appointing the judiciary. So they do the interviews. Well, they, they advertise, they say there's vacancies, they do the interviews, and they shortlist. Now, remember that shortlist has to contain three more names than are needed. Why? Because the president needs some discretion. He doesn't want to be dictated to and told, you will appoint these people. He wants to apply his own opinion. I will t I'll repeat it now. Uh, yes. uh, we're just talking about the, how the judiciary is composed. This thing's irritating. <laughs> um, and so the president has discretion. So in order for the president to exercise that discretion, he can't just act in, you, uh, in, uh, well, in isolation. That's why the Constitution says the president must consult with members of the National Assembly, usually the leaders of the other political parties, so that it's a democratic decision. And then he can, after this, and remember the consultation must be real. He must actually listen to them. And then he can say, well, I think that these three people, it's a, a sort of a unanimous decision. No, the Chief Justice, as chairperson of the JSC, would. Yes, yes. I'm here, yes. Okay. 80 marks will be broken up into 10 mark, 12 mark, 15 mark, and 20 mark. <laughs> they don't need to hear it again. Surely they can understand that. I know. And it doesn't actually make a difference either. <laughs> Well, yes. Well, you know, you know, you know why they would all have the right to vote. Uh, it's because usually people who are not of sound mind are not in a prison, but they're in a mental hospital. So, in fact, we should expect that all the prisoners are of sound mind. But it is possible that they might not be of sound mind and they're in the prison. So, you, the the thinking is all prisoners actually have the right to vote. Necro case. All right, so did you hear that? 10, 15, 20 mark questions. Yeah. 10 marks? Or 12 marks, or 15, or 20. Okay. Yeah, that's. <laughs> okay, are we all satisfied? Yes. Uh, who's asking from? We were just. Yes, the appointment of the judiciary. Yes. Okay. Okay. We were speaking about the process of how the judicial officers are actually appointed, which was simply a case of the JSC interviews. They recommend 
a list to the president that contains three extra names. The president then consults with the members of the National Assembly of the other political parties, and then the sort of that consultation process results in the president then being able to make his decision on who he wishes to appoint. But in terms of the appointment of judges, yes, um, I, I think this, this is a been a problem there because um, it says it has to be three or four names, no? but looking at also the issue of the gender representation, um, I'm not sure if we can also look, look into that and maybe discuss it. There's not much to say. You know, there, there is the imperative to ensure that there's adequate gender representation in the judiciary, but if there are women who are just not willing to apply for the vacancies, there's very little that the judiciary can do. But if the women are not competent, are not competent or qualified, they cannot now use that just to, to add numbers. Yes, there, there is a, it's a rigorous process of appointment. So the person has to have, they have to already have judicial experience, and not many do. And that's why yeah. now acting judges more and more are women. The president can appoint acting judges. In fact, the president doesn't. In each province, the judge president there says to people he knows, who do you think would be a good acting judge? And they are trying to get more and more women. But it's a long-term process. All right, so are we satisfied? Feel free to email if you have any further questions. I don't know if you can help me with this question, but it's very confusing. The relevant question about the judge is on local Schedule four and five. Um, well, all they really do is confirm that the local sphere of government has original powers to deal with things as it sees fit by passing bylaws and by implementing that law. So, schedule five tells them. These are the things that only you can deal with, unless, of course, you're contradicting the national law and the national imperatives. So they, it really confirms that we have this quasi-integrated federation. And quasi because they have to work together. So they're not completely separate, but they have a lot of autonomy to decide what's best for them. Each municipality decides, this is what is going to work for us. Um, that's really the essence, I think. I just want you to assist me here. Eh? Yes? I'm, I'm, I'm going through the constitution. I, I don't know, maybe you could see it because it's a brain or whatever. But I've never come across a section where it's listed schedule four. Schedule it's four. right at the very back. At the end of the constitution. Um, at the end, just before the annexures. Oh. So there's the schedules, then the annexures, then it's the end. So at the last, last. Well, it's actually, if, if you, I don't know if it's on, you got the same page numbers, it's around about page, uh, no, 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 oh, yeah, but he's, I think he wants to know where the actual schedules of himself are, um, so they are on page, they start on page 130, which, which I don't know if your braille version is the same, but they start on page, in fact, it's 129, it starts with the flag, Yes. I think you've got an old version. I don't know what version you've got. Mine's 129. Yes? For example, in the case of uh, speaker on the issue of ballot issue, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So she refers to the, she relies on the whole market. So yeah. if I just say to you, see. Yes, I don't need. I for that too. So yes, not, yes, I don't. I just need the sort of the, the name, even if it's an abbreviated form, yeah. so that I know what case. You don't have to give me the year and the page and the review. Cita yes, no, not the citation, but just the names so that I know what you want. 
uh, TAC case, free. You know, they just even the first name. You don't have to give the respondent. Sometimes you do if it's DA versus the president, and you're trying to make it explicit that the case is about against the president for a certain thing. So you and also, but if it's the UDM versus the national, the speaker of the national assembly, you should mention it because that's integral to the discussion. And DA has got even more, I think, against the president. So can we can we can we discuss the power of the speaker of the national assembly? Yes. Oh yes, okay, you've got the same sort of version that I've got. It's around about there, yeah. So can we discuss a bit about the the uh, jurisdiction of the traditional courts? Yes. I mean there's the, the traditional courts um yeah, I, I don't. I don't know where you want to say that they have been given jurisdiction by our constitution, original jurisdiction, to deal with matters that only affect uh, indigenous communities, sort of on tribal land, and those judges are given quite far-ranging powers. Um, No, no. Yes, because they are supposed to only deal with relatively minor offences or issues and try and reach a, sort of a, a dispute resolution where there's agreement between the parties and then there's maybe payment of cows as recompensation. Because when it comes to criminal matters, then the magistrate's court has jurisdiction. Yeah? It is limited. It is no, they don't have much. Um, they are problem solving. It is a problem solving, a sort of back to Ubuntu, that the democracy is the people coming together, not this aggressive adversarial system that our legal system actually is. All right, are we happy? Yes. Is everyone happy? Yes. All right, thank you. Can Thanks. I ask you all this? Not now. You know why, man? I want them. Can you please assist me that? Uh, what is this? The, the case is of Joseph here. Speaker, EFM, the speaker, and what not. Please ask me, Mr. I did email them to you. Mr. Yeah, Young? It's only one of three. Huh? <laughs> Yes, I did email it to you. And I will email it to you again. I just can't print now. And it wouldn't help you if it's printed anyway. So I've, got, I've sent it to you by email. And I'm sure you can... Is that, is that the feedback? No, it's, the, it's called tutorial letter 103. Do you know what I'm afraid of, ma'am? What? Um, it's a PDF version. Yes, okay. Do you want a Word version? Yes, please, ma'am, because I, I can't go through. Thank you. All right, thanks. <laughs> if you don't know yet after this, then I have no hope for you. <laughs> um, sorry, Johannesburg, did you have a question? No, they've gone. John? Your email address? Um, Far, I thought I did, but I don't seem to have it. Or your student number? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, uh, I think that was helpful. Yes, it's not that bad. Good, I said the same thing. Same thing. So, I've covered that. Yeah?
was interested by them. I by mistake him was my document the question. Oh yes, you can have one, please. Please, I've got too many. <laughs> um, John, your e email address. Uh, All right, thank you. Thank you. I know, um, but you're supposed to know enough that you don't need to have a constitutional thing. <laughs> Oh, and you, and you forget the specific. Uh, Estonia is the laptop. Sorry, uh, let me stop this. Okay.